Hello, 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 and welcome back to Changing the Story, Kick-Ass Women in Business. It is your host, Lana Dingwall. Today, I think I'm being joined by someone who is very much on my energy level vibe, <laughs> Jason Goldberg. So I'm really looking forward to talking with, well, with you, Jason, but for everybody, for personal reasons, because it's always fun to vibe with someone that is fun and has lots of energy, but also shares a lot of really great wisdom. But for those of you who don't know who Jason is, Jason, I'm going to throw it over to you and maybe give us a little rundown on whatever it is you want us to know about you. Yeah, well, I mean, number one, I'm happy to be here with somebody at my energy level and that I'm heavily caffeinated. What's your excuse? What do you I, I'm also heavily caffeinated. <laughs> okay, good, right, good. Well, then the message for this podcast is use substances to be energized. Exactly. Uh, have a great day, everybody. Um, so, yes. Um, yeah, who am I? That's such a great question. If you had asked me half an hour ago or half an hour from now, depending on the level of the espresso and, and what it's doing in my bloodstream, I'd probably give you a different answer. Uh, what I, what I am or who I am, I think at my core is a, is an activator of joy. That's mm. my entire business plan. I actually have a one line business plan and my one line business plan is to leave everybody I meet with at least 5% more joy than I found them. Uh, so I don't care if that is through my coaching, through my speaking, through teaching, through being a Starbucks barista, through being a, a toll person who takes change. I don't care uh, as long as I can hopefully bring some joy to people's lives. So that's kind of who I am in the world right now. That is. I think might be the best answer I've heard so far. Sweet. I win. Yeah. I win you the win. podcast. You win. you win. Substances and joy activator. We're done, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. <laughs> I love that, though. I love that. And this is one of the reasons why I'm really looking forward to actually talking with you. The reason I love your introduction of self is it's not heavily reliant on your resume, Right. And it's really actually not, it's not about what you've accomplished or what you're trying to accomplish. It's more about how you want people to feel and how you, through making others feel that way, obviously end up feeling yourself, which is what I hope people realize when growing a business is actually what you should be striving for. So a thousand percent. I totally believe. And, and everybody listening, you can steal that one line business plan, steal like an artist, as Austin Cleon would say. And all of us, if we really, if we really get down to it, businesses that actually make a difference and stand the test of time and fulfill us, there's going to be something there where our business is a vehicle for some level of change, even if it has nothing to do with your actual business. Mm -hmm. So you can look at like the clothing line, Spiritual Gangster. Have you heard of Spiritual Gangster? The, the I have, clothing? yeah. Yeah, great, great company. So, so he, the, the founder of that, uh, we both spoke at an event one time and I actually got to hear his, his talk. And he actually said that his, his business was a movement for, uh, uh, for, for creativity and, and for uh, the elevation of consciousness disguised as a clothing brand. And I think that's really the opportunity for all of us is to figure out what are we actually, what are we disguising as our business, but what's the real thing? And for me, it's joy. For people listening, it could be joy also, but whatever it is for you, like leaning into that 5% to me is huge. That's funny. Actually, I'm, well, anyone who listens regularly or watches any of my videos, you're probably not surprised by what I'm about to say, but I'm wearing a shirt. It says free the occupied mind. Nice. Uh, and it's by a company called Occupied Mind and they're like, I, I own a lot of their stuff. They're also clients of mine, but it's the same model. They're, they're all about higher consciousness and exploring your shadow self and those dark mm -hmm. parts of you that maybe you feel aren't accepted in society so that you can understand yourself better. Guys in just a really cool hip clothing brand. And the joke is that it's more of a cult, like a personal development cult than it is a clothing brand. And I think so those are really great examples of how we don't have to be in the coaching industry to actually be in service of creating change that we want to see in the world or helping cultivate some type of inner reflection, joy, change, positivity, impact in other people's lives. So that was a great example. And I always take a plug to promote this clothing company that I swear I don't have any shares in. So you should. Just, you I know one should. day I will. Oh, when they, when they go public, trust me. I'm saving. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it's a really great example. And for anyone listening to the podcast, you can't see, but I'm looking over your shoulder right now, Jason. And you have, I can see your book. Well, oh, I can good. see two okay. questions. There's two things I can see, actually. What will you create today? Yep. Which is, a, I think, a really fun curiosity question. Again, leaning into that space of it's not about what are you going to produce, but what are you going to create? What are you going to birth? And it has that fun kind of curiosity side to it. But then on the other side of your shoulder, prison break, which 
oh, I know what it is. Um, but I kind of want you to talk about it a little bit because you talk a lot about the concept of being a prisoner versus being a self leader. And it's, we might not have used those terms on this show, but I talk a lot about ensuring and really cultivating an intentional mindset around the type of business you're trying to build, because a lot of us try to fit in. And Mm -hmm. when we try to fit in, what we end up doing is replicating someone else's dream, someone else's business model. And every step we take, while we might be getting reassurance from outside that we're succeeding, every step in that direction takes us a step further from where it is that we are supposed to be going. Mm -hmm. And I know the concept of prisoner versus self-leadership in terms of how you talk about it is sort of in that, that relation around how we have to break free from what's expected of us or break free free from what we think we should be doing or how we should be doing it Mm -hmm. and actually feeling empowered enough to lead ourselves. So you're obviously an expert on this. Well, I mean, I'd love yeah, for you to I'm talk about expert. it. Yeah, I'm an expert in so much as all my expertise, which is really just I'm an expert on one thing, and it's my own experience of life. Yeah. Uh, and so I'd love to say, like, I did a bunch of you know research and and uh, and intellectual exercises to figure out this distinction and how you shift it. And it was like, no, it's just I was primarily a prisoner the first 30 years of my life, and so I got really really good at it. And some people get jealous of the level of mastery I have around being a prisoner, uh, but it's okay. <laughs> like, it's, you know, don't don't be too jealous of me. There's there's time. There's more time. Uh, so so that. That distinction, the prisoner versus self-leader distinction, really came from, honestly, I mean, the majority of my life, even though all my life I've always been kind of like the joyful, you know, kind of class clown, uh, center of attention, you know, always making people laugh kind of person, that was uh, developed as, you know, you, you mentioned earlier, the shadow side two of the things that are now my biggest gifts were really developed as a way to deal with my shadows. And so growing up as the fat kid, I was always the fat kid from the time I was in first grade, I was kind of already pudgy uh, and, and uh, husky was the word that was used back then. Uh, I don't know why naming a kid's size after a large fluffy dog felt like it wouldn't be judgmental, yeah. but it's there we are. Uh, and so I was husky and then it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And so when I was 15, I was 250 pounds. Uh, which, and if you remember when you're 15, kids are really loving and compassionate yeah. and never do it all based on how you look. So that was fun. Uh, and, uh, and I was also a hopeless romantic and I was like, the girls would never look at me as like a viable option. And so it was really crazy and, and really difficult being a teenager. And then I realized that the way I could get over feeling uh, not enoughness because of my body or because of the way I looked or, or because of whatever was to make people laugh. Right. And so that that humor was developed as kind of a security mechanism to deal with my not enoughness. And I really wanted to feel connection with the girls that were around me that didn't see me as a potential, you know, boyfriend. And so I developed empathy so that I could actually connect with them and feel this level of connection with them. And so humor and empathy are the two things that drive my life and my business now, but they were created out of a shadow. Right. Mm. And so so that whole time from, you know, a child to teenager all the way up through my 20s. I dealt with depression and anxiety, uh, whether it was low level anxiety or like debilitating anxiety, um, lots of stress and, and suicidal thoughts into my kind of mid to late twenties even. So it's not like something that just happened early on in in life. And, and a lot of this stemmed from the, 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 what I call the prisoner mentality, which you can call victim consciousness. You can call it a lot of different things. Uh, I, I don't propose that I made it up. I just propose that I mastered it. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and it was really this realization for me that I have a choice in any given moment to show up and look through the lens of a prisoner who is at the whim of circumstance, who is at the whim of what's going on in the economy, who's at the whim, uh, whim of who's in the White House, who's at the whim of the song on the radio that reminds you of your ex-boyfriend or girlfriend and you just break down. And, and that's okay, feeling the feelings is fine, but having your happiness uh, or sadness dictated on external circumstances was the thing that I kind of learned to do. It's, it's a learned behavior, it's not a, it's something in your DNA. Mm-hmm. And so that's one, one way that I can look at the world and, and approach the world and react to the world. Uh, and the flip side of that is the self leader, which is it's the same pair of glasses. And as you see on the cover of the book, for those who are watching the video, there's two lenses there. One is like a prison cell and one is kind of a very generic uh, stock photo of an open road. And, and when you are looking through the, the self leader perspective, you take full responsibility for the role that you're creating in your life, uh, uh, in your experience of life, not from a place of shame, blame or judgment, but from a place of if there is a problem, 
I'm the problem, which is amazing because if I'm the problem, I'm also the solution. Mm. And so it's this very, very small shift moment by moment. It's not an all or nothing thing. You don't do something. You don't even read my book and then you're a self leader for life. <laughs> it's a moment by moment thing. Uh, and the, the awareness of recognizing, oh, in this moment, I'm being a total prisoner. That's a win. Whether you shift into self leader or not, just understanding, oh, I'm contributing to what's going on and how I feel right now. That's a huge step in the right direction. And it's what I have I'm trying to live in the direction of myself every day and trying to help my clients with as well. Mm, I really liked your explanation of that too. Because I, and I like the word prisoner over how you use the word prisoner over that vi the victim mentality, which it's, an, it's another way of doing it. But whenever we use other types of language, it can allow us to see the analogy clear to make connections to our own life. And it wasn't until you started talking about it that it made me think a lot about Ram Dass and how mm. he talks about how you can't escape prison if you're not even aware that you are a prisoner to begin with, mm. because then there's nothing to escape. And when you were describing your, like the upbringing and the pain and suffering that you went through from being like a young child into your, in your twenties, it's that idea that so much of that in your reflection, it was happening unconsciously. Like it was not, you didn't know you were a prisoner. And so because yeah. you don't know your prisoner, you can't escape. Yeah. And, and you may, you said it, like you even said, like you use the word like language, right? Like using prisoner versus, versus victim in that, in that example, the same thing happens here is that having a, a prisoner perspective is something that it's like using a language. Like it's mm -hmm. like learning a foreign language. So if you're raised in a household that spoke Spanish your entire life, you're not dumb or unevolved or wrong for not knowing how to speak French. It's just mm -hmm. not the language that you were raised with. I was raised with a lot of prisoner language. And so that become that became my fluent dialect. And so I had to also start with this new language, this new perspective on life and fumble through it. And then it becomes one day you realize once you've been studying French long enough that somebody speaks to you and you realize, oh, I could respond in Spanish or French in this moment without even really thinking too hard about it because it becomes natural, more natural for you. But otherwise, how else would I know what to say except for Spanish? Because that's what I was raised with. So it's just something... I I'm so adamant about people not using this awareness mm -hmm. to then start shaming and judging them. So, oh God, I can't believe I've been a prisoner for that. What is wrong with me that this has happened for mm -hmm. so long? That's like, that's, the, that, that's the inception of prisonerness. It's like, it's like being sad that you spilled milk and then being mad at yourself for being sad that you spilled. It just gives the spiral. <laughs> yeah, it's a cycle. Deeper deeper. <laughs> it's a cycle. So this is meant to be just like a gentle awareness of like, oh, that's so funny. It's been me this whole time. Like that's hilarious. It's like a Ben Stiller movie. It's like, that's hilarious. That's been happening. That's been me the whole time. And then we can move forward. Yeah. And I think too, the word prisoner is actually more empowering because at least for me, when I interpret what you're saying, I though am a more, I'm an optimistic, always looking for the silver lining person. Yep. But when I, I think of prisoner, it's like realizing that, yeah, I'm a prisoner in a prison that I created. And so it is empowering. There's a lot of responsibility that comes with it, but it's empowering. Whereas feeling that I'm the victim, when we're in victimhood, it feels really helpless. And a lot of us don't actually ever want to consider ourselves to be a victim because it is so helpless and vulnerable that we will deny the fact that maybe we are stuck in victimhood simply because we don't want to be a victim. And so I like, I love the idea of, of prisoner when expressed from the idea of, yeah, you've created it. So you can, you can tear down the walls. It, for some personalities, it might make it a little bit easier to examine because sometimes people, yeah, people just get so defensive about like, and I'm one of those people. So this is how, why I'm saying it. I'm one of those people that's like, I am not a victim. Um, because oh, God forbid I'd be helpless. <laughs> yeah, no, totally. and, and that's one of the reasons I don't use victim is because I believe there are people who are truly victims. They've been victimized mm. by something. And I never want to trivialize people who have actually been victimized, right? This is not for people who have God forbid been beaten in an alley or had an abusive relationship or whatever else they have been victimized, but they are not victims in, in, in my, in, in my perspective, they have been victimized and they have the ability to shift into self-leadership whenever they're ready to do that. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's it. It's true. I think too, when we trivialize the word, it's the same thing with the word trigger. We, I, I've heard you speak about it and joke about like the, tr the trigger word is sometimes I also find that we have desensitized what the actual meaning of trigger 
is. It's supposed to be for something huge, but we, and that's how language works, right? We sometimes adapt something that's meant to be taken really seriously and we dilute it till it loses all meaning. Yeah. And it, it um, but that's me digressing. That's okay. I love that. I agree with you hundred <laughs> uh, percent. Okay. One of the things I was listening to you talk about, which I would love, because again, it's still actually very much in the zone of what we're talking about around language and being really intentional with language. You were talking about how you hate the word or not, you don't hate, you hate a word in the phrase work ethic. Right. And I'd love for you to kind of speak to that because what you talk about through this, I think is a really important topic. And we talk about it a lot on the podcast around how self-compassion is actually the, one of the best strategies that you can employ to succeed and live the life that you want. But it seems so willy nilly that we don't even consider it a strategy. And so I, I feel like with where you kind of talk about work ethic, it, it's a, it's a different take on that concept. Yeah, totally. And so, so at the core of everything I talk about is, is really even beyond prisoner and self leader, that's kind of a, a tool in the tool belt, but at, at kind of the, the higher level or the meta level, which are higher or lower, whichever, depending on what part of California you live in, it's either yeah. high level or meta. <laughs> it just depends. Uh, uh, well, I'm in Los Angeles, so we'll call it meta um, is, is that, when we take things too seriously, then we lower our level of consciousness and we have less opportunity to see possibilities. Mm. And so I actually did a, a web show for a while uh, with, with a guy who was my coach, still my coach, and, and, a, and a good friend of mine named Steve Chandler. And we did a show called The Not So Serious Life. We did like 71 episodes of this show called The Not So Serious Life. And it was all about taking people's questions about whatever was going on in their life or their business and humorizing it without trivializing it, right? Trying to bring levity to the situation. Because what I know to be true is, you know, if you go back and you watch, were you ever a fan of Willy Wonka? Like the the movie or the, the yeah. story. So I love the original. The, the Johnny Depp one was an abomination. But the <laughs> original one, the original one was incredible. And, and I remember this, this, uh, the scene in the beginning where, where Charlie is with his family and Grandpa Joe and everybody else. And they're living in squalor in this little house. And there's, you know, the four adults all sharing one bed together, complete poverty, nothing that anybody would ever look at and say, that's beautiful. That's amazing. I would love to have that as my life. To me, that's kind of lower level consciousness. It's right there on the ground looking at the thing and you're so close to the thing, you can't really see what you're looking at. Juxtapose that, I just use the word juxtapose. I feel really special right now. Uh, <laughs> juxtapose that, compare that, for those of you who are not pretentious listening, compare that with the end where he's in the Wonkavator and it shoots up through the chocolate factory and it's, it's over the city and they look down and they see their house and Charlie goes, Grandpa Joe, look, it's our house and there's our school and it's so beautiful. Mm. Like, it's so beautiful. In the beginning, this was like poverty and squalor. And the reason I bring that up is because once you have elevated yourself to a higher level of perspective and consciousness, you can see things in a different way that you couldn't normally see them. So I say all this to say that to me, the root of being able to move forward, gain momentum, continue having traction uh, and not being swayed by distraction, right? Distraction, breaking that down, undoing the traction you've created is to stop taking things so seriously. So full circle back to work ethic. To me, work ethic has a very serious, heavy sound to it because the word ethic is involved. And ethic is a moral guideline. It's a moral compass. It's a principle. It's like you're right or you're wrong. And so now it means if I have a good work ethic, I'm a good person. And if I don't have a good work ethic, then I'm a piece of crap. And I personally don't want to play that game. That feels like a lot of pressure to do. And so what I want to do is, is I want to unseriousize that as much and realize that there are tons of things that I do each and every day that I have no ethic for. I don't have a toothbrushing ethic, and yet I tend to brush my teeth every day. I don't have a shower ethic, and yet I tend to take a shower every day. I don't have a tell your friends you love them ethic, and yet I tend to tell my friends pretty much every day that I love them. Mm. So why are we putting so much pressure on work to be that same thing? Why can't we just show up and do the thing because we're creators and that's what we do? And so the more we can, I think, loosen our grip, as Sadhguru would say, loosen our grip, loosen the tight grip that we have on what it means to be an entrepreneur and all the things we think we're supposed to be doing. And we kind of just loosen it up a little bit and we get the blood flowing through our hands instead of rushing to our knuckles. We can see so many more opportunities to move forward without shaming ourselves in the process, if that makes sense. It, I'm, could that whole time have just been like preach in the background, but <laughs> because it's zoom, it kind of, you know, the audio focuses. So I, I didn't want to take away from what you were saying. Uh, no, all of that makes so much sense. And it, it truly is about 
leaning into possibility and leaning into the possibility of what can be. And whenever we do that, it does, even if it's just a few degrees, take us out of the pit that we were in before. And that pit is often that scarcity mentality we have. And in that scarcity place, there's so much fear and lack of gratitude and all this stuff. And it's hard to have that higher perspective. Like your really Wonka example was perfect. It's really hard to have that higher perspective sometimes, but it's important for us to remind ourselves that it's there. And I'm a huge believer that humor is actually a way to do that for us because it just makes us laugh. And I think in entrepreneurship, especially in entrepreneurship, and even honestly, especially in the coaching space, there's a lot of ego in it. And with ego, we have this notion that we have to be super serious all the time. And to laugh is to be immature and to be immature is counter to my identity, which is my ego. And I, the humor piece, and it's funny, uh, you, well, we weren't recording, but Jason and I earlier were talking about how everyone poops and cleaning off, cleaning out poop off of people. <laughs> yeah, obviously. We all had it done. Someone wiped our butts. Uh, but I think it's this really important thing that we forget about, which is it's supposed to be fun. What is the point of us putting in the work? What is the point of us stretching ourselves, leaning into fear? What is, what is the point of all of that work if at the end of it, we don't get to have joy or humor? And sometimes we can, we can get stuck even in the space of the work ethic. Like the concept work ethic means there's no room for fun. Like when yeah. I hear work ethic, it means there's no room for fun. And so I sometimes try to avoid it. But it's with what you were just saying. How about you just drop the word ethic and recognize that there's so many things that we do every day, like like clockwork, that get done, but we don't try and ascribe some type of ethical meaning behind how we accomplish it. And because we don't ascribe that ethical meaning, there's no space to be shamed. Like whenever we forget to brush our teeth, you're just sort of like, oh my gosh, my breath stinks and I feel disgusting. I feel disgusting, but you know, you're not disgusting, but you're like, oh my God, I, I feel gross. And it's funny and it's humorous. And you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that. Yeah. It's information. That's, that's <laughs> all it is. It's information. And, and the more we realize that everything that we see in our lives is a data point, uh, you know, when you actually, um, wake up in the morning and like you check your phone to see what the weather is. Right. And you either grab a jacket or you don't you don't judge the weather. You don't judge that it's hot. You don't judge, you know, God or the universe for making it a snowy day. Like it's it just information. And, and then we take that information in. And actually what we do is we, we change uh, data into information by taking action on the information, right? Otherwise mm. it's just data and there's nothing. But when we realize that the data we're getting is not emotional, it's simply meant to illuminate an opportunity for you, uh, then we can act on that. And if you receive data that doesn't illuminate an activity uh, or, or a way to move forward, then it's not data for you. You can leave that data behind and only focus on the data that actually moves you forward. Mm -hmm. And so my question to you would be, cause you're, you're good at this, or I'm assuming through this conversation that you're good at this. And this is sometimes the issue that I, I know I get into with people that I admire and that I know people who admire me get into is it's always this assumption of, oh, well, it's just easy for you, or you're naturally inclined to do that. And I know through my experience that ultimately that's not true. It's often something that's cultivated. It's, and as you said, you were really great at being the prisoner <laughs> and now you you focus on kind of breaking out, but what would be some suggestions or even recommendations that you would give to someone who feels that they, they understand that they need to let go of the concept of ethic in relation to their work. They understand that they could be a prisoner in a prison of their own making. And they're on the cusp of like, they know it's true, but to believe that it's true also means that they have to totally let go of a way of living. And that, yeah. that can be really hard, right? When we have to shift, we, we are hearing that so much right now about people talking about shifting the paradigm. Um, and so for anyone that is sometimes that being like, what the fuck does that mean? Shifting the paradigm. Cause sometimes I'm like, Hey guys, like we need to make, this is, you sound crazy. Um, but shifting the paradigm, it's for me, at least my understanding and how I think about it is it's just the realization that reality doesn't actually have to exist 
the way that we were living. And the, one of the examples I always give on the podcast or in my life is for a large portion of my life, I thought that I was straight. So I lived my life as a straight person and just kept being like, this doesn't fit, but never contemplated that maybe I was just trying to live the wrong life. And so in, that was a shift in paradigm for me because it was a shift in my reality, but nothing changed other than my understanding of self and the world around me. Uh, and so for people who are kind of on that cusp, their own version of coming out, but <laughs> coming out yeah. into breaking free, yeah. um, what would be some like tips that you would have for them? Because it can be so scary, especially when you feel there aren't a lot of people in your life who are doing it. And so it can make you feel kind of crazy or you're not sure again, because you have to like let go of a lot of stuff as I'm sure you know from your own experience. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'll make it really easy for people. Like there's nothing you need to change your belief on and there's nothing you need to let go of, right? Because that's, you can, that's, I'm not saying it's not helpful, but if that feels like a tall order, um, there's something you could do that's even smaller. And, and it's, and it's really what I, I kind of, uh, I go back and practice all the time. So back to what you said in the very beginning of, of this, this part of the conversation with like, assuming it's just easy for, for whoever's doing it. Uh, no, this is the work that I have to do on myself every day. Like my, my, my business and for everybody, your business and your business and your like romantic relationships are the two biggest vehicles for transformation in your life, your own life, not everybody else's. Your own yeah. life. It brings up all your crap, right? It brings up all your crap. So the reason that I do this work around helping people be more joyful and playful in their business and in their lives is because I need to have the reminders because left to my own devices, I go directly into seriousness. I take things way too seriously. I get way too hard on myself. Like I do all those things. So this is a reminder for me to keep doing this for me as well. So, so it's by no means an easy thing. What I know now is for me, my definition of transformation around anything, but especially in, in these kinds of things is not... The goal here for me and, and the way I teach it is not immunity, it's navigation, right? Mm -hmm. I am not trying to be immune to stressful thoughts. I'm not trying to be immune to anxiety. I'm not trying to be immune to fear. I'm trying to learn ways to, to navigate that so that the window of time from when I feel like I'm being hijacked to the time that I'm back in a self-leader mode is just shortened. It's, it's a smaller window of time. If that goes from being three hours to one hour for you, major effing win. Celebrate the hell out of that. So I, I wanted to say that kind of upfront. But the really small thing you could do here that's, that's even easier than letting it go or changing your beliefs is, so okay, so when I was, so I was raised by a single mother, I'm an only child. I've been around pretty much just women my entire life. My mom, I was raised in a salon environment, which was great because my mom was a nail tech my entire, my entire life growing up. And so I would be the kid doing homework in the corner of the salon. And so I was exposed to every ethnicity, every sexual orientation, every, everything early on, which meant that by the time I got out in the world and people were talking about tolerance, I didn't understand the concept yeah. um, because it's like, what are we tolerating? They're just people like everybody else. There were, there were gay people who were nice and gay people who were assholes. There were white people who were nice and white people who were assholes. Like they're just people. So, mm -hmm. so anyway, so, so I was in that environment a lot, but being a, a single mother and an only child, we would go to the mall together and I was a fairly well-behaved kid. So, you know, I'm six, seven years old. My mom doesn't have to like hold my hand all the time. And we would go into the mall and, <laughs> and uh, Okay. So we go into the mall. I can't believe I'm going to tell you this. And then, uh, and we would kind of be walking around and she would kind of let me do my thing. And then she realized at one point that I was gone. I had disappeared. And so she goes around to try to find where I am. And she finds me looking up a mannequin skirt. <laughs> because that's what little boys do, right? So yeah. she's, I'm sitting there looking up the skirt, trying to see what's underneath because I'm curious. Now, here's the interesting thing about that. My mom saw that and was mortified. She was embarrassed. She ran over. She grabbed me by the arm. She took me away as fast as possible. It was a direct reflection to her about her parenting and what she's done as a mom and who I am as a child. All of these things happened. And it's because her relationship to me was that she's my mother. And being the mother of this child doing this thing, there's a very serious relationship. Now, juxtapose that. I'm just going to go for it. You said paradigm. Yeah. I said juxtapose twice. I'm winning this vocab game right now. But, but, but compare that with let's say you are in the mall as well and you see from across the department store that this is happening you have a totally different relationship to the scenario and you may think oh my god look at that he's so cute he's like looking up the skirt that's adorable or you see my mom struggling and go oh that woman she is doing her best she's obviously doing this all by herself i can't even imagine how tough it is to raise a little boy you have a totally different relationship to me and thus your your explanation or your response to the mm -hmm. situation is different 
And so what I'm advocating here is that instead of letting something go or, or, or trying to get rid of a story or trying to overcome something or trying to have a different belief is just try to have a more casual relationship with the thoughts as they come up have a more casual relationship with the feelings. I don't want to pretend it's not there. My goal is to try to have it be where my, my emotions and my thoughts can be without being a nuisance, mm -hmm. right? That the, that the machine of my body and my mind run the same, no matter whether or not there's a presence of those things. So if I'm driving a car, let's say for example, and in the passenger seat of the car is the most angry, sad, depressed, judgmental, mean person in the world, the steering wheel still works the same. The gas pedal and brake pedals still work the same. The machinery works the same. So I can acknowledge this person is sitting next to me. It doesn't change the way I operate the car. And so that's this thing where if I'm having a more casual relationship with the thing, I say, oh, wow, there's some anxiety there. Cool. Mm. I, I wonder what that's trying to bring up. I'm going to let that just be and do its thing. And maybe I need to meditate. Maybe I just need to get to work and not worry about it. But I don't need to necessarily overcome it. I just need to not have such a serious relationship with the thought. Mm, yeah. Also, I love the mannequin story. <laughs> if I were to have seen you, I would have been laughing so hard uh, and just been like, you get it, little kid. Like, you're curious. Kids are going to be kids. Um, and, and what if we did that? And what if we did that to our own stress and anxiety and fear? Right? Exactly. What if we just had that same conversation with our stress, anxiety, and fear? Oh my God, that's so adorable. You think the way to move me forward is to make me feel terror. That's, a, yes. that's so cute that that's the way you think that this should be done. Yeah, and it is. It's, it's sort of the, uh, well, I know it from like a Buddhist philosophy standpoint, which is when you, with what you were just describing, if you can't let go of this stuff, it's curiosity and playfulness versus judgment versus shame. And it really is about trying to view the, situ you can't change the situation. Like the situation is as it is. And the first step is just accepting it as such. And then from there, what we can do is you might not be able to let it go. Or as you said, like move past it, but you can just ask yourself, how can I try and view this from a different perspective? Get curious around why am I holding so much shame around this moment when other people have told me something opposite. And we all have those stories in our lives where we recount something and someone where we're counting the story to was also present. And they're like, oh my gosh, that's not at all how I remember it. Or that's not at all how I saw it. Or I thought you were so funny or I thought you were great. And it's, we have these clues that we tend to be very judgmental and shame-based when it comes to us. And we often give others way more space to have trials and errors than we extend to ourselves, particularly if we have children. Uh, we tend to extend it more to children than we, we do ourselves. And so I think, yeah, a lot of what you were saying resonates with that idea of it's about curiosity and playfulness because like when something's super thick, you know, inserting that playfulness or inserting that humor in some way can give you the right amount of breathing room to see it from a different perspective. It doesn't mean that you're being insensitive it just means that maybe this is actually the easiest way for you to get to your desired outcome, which is to just feel better about the situation. And nothing does that like a good laugh. Um, and the laugh can be at your own expense. I often, I find myself, I admitted to this a few weeks ago and I told people the same thing. I'm like, I don't really know why I'm telling you this, but sometimes when I'm like, I do a lot of walking meditation because I have a lot of energy. So I do a lot, especially in COVID because I play a lot of sports and I can't play any of them. So I was like, right. so I've been doing walking meditations and sometimes I can get really stuck in a dark, as you would say, prisoner mm -hmm. spiral where I'm essentially putting myself in isolation. Mm -hmm. And the only way sometimes in those moments I can get out of it is by like laughing at how absurd it is. Like at laughing at myself being like, why are you doing this to yourself? Like we've been here, like you're ruminating over the same issue we, I thought we dealt with last week. And then the laughing gives me just enough space, as you said, to be like, oh, now I can get curious. Now, now I can kind of, or, and maybe it's lean into the possibility of how, how could this situation maybe be a little bit different than what I'm remembering it for? And am I choosing to stay a prisoner of my thought right now or this experience when there's possibility for it to be something else? So I loved, you're really great at bringing like humor and 
like bomb wisdom together. Well, thank you. That's, <laughs> that's why I, I hope my sweet spot is there. So I appreciate, yeah. I appreciate that reflection. And I will say too, like for people who feel like, you know, laughing about it or I, I totally believe in like ridiculing your fears. And I do mm -hmm. that with my clients. I never ridicule the person, but if we can mm -hmm. help the client and help ourselves to ridicule our fears, uh, sneak up kind of from behind and ridicule them. then the ego is just kind of caught off guard and doesn't know what to do with it. Uh, but sometimes it may feel like humor or laughter is just not accessible. Right. And, yeah. that, and that's okay too. And so what I would say to people who feel in, in that place and they're like, well then, okay, nothing's making me laugh right now. I guess I'm screwed. Don't worry, we got you covered. Uh, yeah. This is this is another thing that it, it's an exercise that I kind of made up on the fly one day when I was just feeling super anxious and super stressed out and in a massive place of fear. And, and it's this thing that I call uh, PBQs, prison break questions. Funny enough, mm -hmm. I developed it after the book came out, so it's actually not in the book. <laughs> but, uh, but prison break questions are essentially questions that take something that is a problem and make it no longer problematic. It doesn't mm -hmm. solve the problem. It just makes it no longer a problem. And it's, it's a very simple formula. There's many, there are as many prison break questions as there are situations you can encounter. But the, the format of a prison break question very simply is, if I knew, what would I do, right? Mm -hmm. If I knew, what would I do? And so one day, I was, uh, I, was, I was just feeling all this anxiety and this stress. This is probably, I don't know, four, four years ago or so. And I remember where this is when I was still living in North Carolina. And I, I'm, I'm trying to figure it out. I'm like, I'm going to go on a walk and maybe it'll just kind of burn off or something. I'm walking. I'm trying to do all the work. I'm doing the self-talk. I'm doing the things. Nothing is working. It's just getting heavier and heavier. And so I said, okay, let me, let me try to use some more of my own tools. And so this prison break question occurred to me. And the prison break question for me that I, I want you all to, to use is if I knew this feeling I'm feeling right now was going to last for exactly the next 60 minutes. And at minute 61, it was going to vanish. Mm. How would I treat myself for the next 60 minutes? Right? If I knew, and you could say 10 minutes, if I knew this feeling was going to last for exactly 10 minutes and without me doing anything, it was going to evaporate at 10 minutes in one second. How would I treat myself for the next 10 minutes? And when I asked myself that question, I went to well, I'd be way more gentle with myself. I would, I would stop trying to fix it. I would stop judging myself mm -hmm. that my tools don't seem to be working, that I'm a hypocrite, that, I, that I'm a fraud, that I'm a, an imposter because I can't get myself out of this thing. I would just be way more loving and gentle to myself. And literally within five or 10 minutes, it kind of dissipated, or at least it, it minimized itself enough that I could kind of get back to life. So, so take that question uh, anytime you're feeling any of these things, and it just gives you permission to feel it, takes you out of resistance to the feeling, and being out of resistance to what you're feeling is one of the fastest ways to move through what it is you're feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like that's a really great tool, or it is, and it, it plays into the Willy Wonka analogy too, because sometimes, yeah, when we are really in the pits of it and the pits of it are often yeah like the shame imposter syndrome like we just are really great at we're like what what other shit can I add on to how shitty I feel right now you know you're like yeah it's a pile on um and sometimes it, you've we've created so much pressure on ourselves that yeah like the idea of trying to problem solve out of it feels impossible and that's a really great question just being like if I knew that this were to only last x how would I show up or treat myself or how would I perceive this differently? And it, like your Willy Wonka example, it's just about trying to slightly change the vantage point at which you are perceiving the situation that you're in. And sometimes just shifting your lens a little bit or shifting your perspective a little bit can be not the thing that totally gets you out of it, but the thing that just gives you the break that makes the next step a little bit easier versus feeling so all encompassing. Um, and I also just appreciate you sharing that because I know for, again, so many people, we can just get stuck in this idea of, oh yeah, people like Jason never struggle. He's perfect. He's great. <laughs> no, are you kidding me? I, I have an, an IV of morphine in my, you, that's why I'm not showing you my arm. This is how I can yeah. be so chill right now. I'm just kidding. No, but it's true. Uh, it's, it, we all face it. And, and that's why I always, you know, one of the things I always keep in mind is one of my favorite quotes of all time from Einstein. And he says, you can't solve a problem with the same thinking that created it. Mm -hmm. So when we're in the stuff when we're in the crap and we're in the pit, we don't have access to what's actually going to solve that thing. So instead of trying to solve it, our goal should just be to increase our level of consciousness, to lighten up just a little bit. You know, the, the, the way I think about this is you think about like a hot air balloon and hot air balloons have the, you know, the weights that they have all mm -hmm. around the actual balloon itself. 
And so trying to overcome what's going on when we're in the pit, when we're in the darkest spot, trying to solve it is like trying to, to ascend in a hot air balloon mm. with all the weights on it. You can pull the rip cord and have as much fire as you want. And even though the balloon will kind of go up, it'll do it with so much force and so much push. And it's not a natural thing. But then as soon as we start to very lightly release the sandbags off the side of the hot air balloon, the hot air balloon was designed to ascend on its own mm. without a lot of force, without a lot of effort, without a lot of pressure. And so instead of trying to push to get through something, a lot of times just allowing yourself to feel it will allow those weights to start drifting off a little bit and you start just ascending naturally as a result. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that, that that's the, the... We've all been in situations too where where we have a problem and we're talking to someone and they're trying to solve our problem and we get frustrated because we're like, I don't want any solutions right now. I just want some compassion or I just want, I just need to process the information. And it's, and we've also been in situations where probably we've been, we've been giving advice when uh, I know I'm a culprit of that when someone just needs space. And so it can be like applying that same logic to ourselves where solving the problem might be just making it worse and it's causing some frustration. So yeah, how can we just create a little bit more ease? And that's often just through compassion, through space, through asking curiosity-based questions, verse, which are circulated kind of like, what do you need? How can I support you? Versus in that situation, what can feel like a more of a shame-based question, which is like, how are you going to get out of this? Or I can't believe you're, you're here. And uh, I've talked a little bit about how like when we hear something from our ego, it's, it is often a little bit more negative and intense where it, our intuition or our like higher self, it's often very soft and nurturing. And so I know for me, a tactic that I use is my ego is really great at pretending it's my intuition. So I listen to it, but then I catch myself. I'm being like, Oh, but I'm being really degrading right now, or I'm being really shame-based, or I'm being really judgmental of myself. And that's a sign that that's actually my ego because my intuition would never speak to me that way. It's just like incapable. It's, it's only like that soft, more loving, nurturing, compassionate style thing. So I know for me, that's a tool that I use because like I said, my, my ego is really good at pretending it's my intuition. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think all of us experience that. It's, it's actually funny. I, I have two chapters in my book that I personally go back to on a pretty regular basis just to refresh for myself. Mm-hmm. And one of them, the chapter is called Your Intuition is Drunk. That's actually the name of the chapter. Because if you think about this, like if you have a a mentor or a friend or a coach or a family member that anytime you go to them, they're always there for you. They always have great advice. They're always, they always have your back. And one day you're struggling with something and you go to ask them for help and you walk in the door and you see them like completely obliterated drunk on the floor. Would you ask them for help in that moment, right? Like even if you did, would you trust what they would tell you in return? And actually, the even even deeper, the flip side of that is that if that actually happened and your mentor, your friend, your uncle, your whatever was on the floor drunk, you would immediately, no matter what you were dealing with, be like, oh my God, let me take care of you. Like, let me let me make sure you're okay and let me, you know, get you some water and let me get you in a, on a couch so you can relax. You would take care of it. And then once it's sobered up, then you can ask it for whatever, whatever help you need. And so yes. that's where I think that the magic eight ball, I actually have a, a Freud magic eight ball. Okay, yeah. Hilarious. It just says, uh, tell me about your mother every time you show it. Uh, but, but, you know, the magic eight balls that say like, ask again later, they get that. The, the magic eight ball gets drunk intuition, right? It's mm-hmm. not always the right time to ask. So if the answer you're getting from your quote intuition does not illuminate something that you can move forward with, it's not your intuition that you're asking. It's definitely mm-hmm. your ego. Mm-hmm. And it's, yeah, because I, a lot of the times people, I've been here to myself, but people would be like, my intuition is telling me this. And I'm like, that's, that's just fear. Like, that's fear. That's not intuition. And it, it can be hard though, because it's, it's intuition. It's so woo, quote unquote, woo woo, that you can't, it can be sometimes hard to understand what's the differences between the two. Uh, but it's true. It, it, it is it's like, yeah, asking your drunk friend for, for advice. And, and then it can perpetuate this shame cycle when if we follow what we think is our intuition and then we fall further down the rabbit hole, it actually makes us distrust ourselves when it, it really it's about recognizing that wasn't our intuition. That was cleverly masked something else. And we all do it. Like all of us do it. All of us think we're going in the right direction and then we find out 
that were in a rabbit hole. I don't know. Have you ever watched Westworld? I watched it in the very, very beginning, but I haven't watched it recently. It was a great show though. Yeah. Well, I think it was, this is in season one, but they talk about when they're trying to create consciousness in the hosts, how at first they thought it was a pyramid, sort of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. But the one then when they realize this is actually a maze. And I thought that it was a beautiful description of our, it's obviously in a description of human consciousness, not the robot's consciousness, right. but how it's when we're in a maze, sometimes we think we're going down the right path only to realize that we've hit a dead end and we have to like retrace our steps. And so I think it's like this uh, for human consciousness, for entrepreneurship, for everything, for living a good life. It's, it's accepting the idea that sometimes we're going to go down the wrong path. We're going to hit a dead end. That's totally okay. That's the point. Like the things we want in life, it's not a clear cut forward trajectory. It is more like a really complicated maze and, maybe we're going to get lost <laughs> and that's okay. Yeah, you will. I mean, we, we all get lost at some point. We, we yeah. don't know until we're lost. Uh, but there, there's never been anything that any of us, the two of us or anybody else listening or watching this, there, there's nothing that any of us uh, have been through that we haven't gotten through because mm -hmm. we're here right now. And so the only evidence we have is that we always are resilient enough to keep moving forward. It's literally mm -hmm. the only evidence we have of life right now. So any other story that tells us we can't go through something, that's the thing that's a bold faced lie because mm -hmm. we have evidence of the contrary for our entire lives. Yeah, that's perfect. That is Absolutely true. <laughs> and we've often faced a lot more than we give ourselves credit for because I, I find, I know at least for me personally, hindsight, we don't, we remember things differently and we tend to not want to, we tend to always want to picture ourselves being a little bit more resilient than we think. So sometimes we can actually forget about times that we have struggled and we showed up for ourselves and we need to rem remind ourselves of those types of things whenever we're doing anything. Yeah, definitely. I have loved talking to you. Um, Me too. Good. <laughs> uh, as I wrap it up, or we wrap it up, I would love, just because I have liked, love, really loved talking to you, what is just anything random? It, it doesn't even have to do with anything we've talked about today, or it could have everything to do with what we've talked about today. But what is just something you are like, I want to know, I'm going to share this piece of information. And it doesn't even have to be insightful. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, why would I start now? Uh, so... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I love this. Uh, I, you know, I, the thing that's coming to my mind right now is um, the, the power of the power of being lit up, right? Because like what I'm getting from this conversation is that we're both lit up about the conversation. We're both lit up about the topic. We're both lit up about the, the mechanism of having conversation. And there hasn't been one time during this conversation where I've had any fear, stress, anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts, anything else like that. So it stands to reason that if we are trying to focus on things that light us up, then just by, na by a natural, uh, the natural unfolding of the way the world works, there isn't room for those two things to coexist. We mm -hmm. just like, we can't sneeze with our eyes open kind of thing. Um, you can't be uh, in, in, immersed in something that lights you up and also simultaneously be afraid or stressed or anxious, right? It just, when you're in that flow state, especially, you just can't feel that thing. And so I guess my, the thing that's coming up for me is just to share a, a quote that you've probably heard a million times, but I really want you to hear it uh, through the lens of this whole conversation that the two of us have been having is this quote that is a guiding principle for my life and my business from Howard Thurman. And he says, don't ask what the world needs, ask what makes you come alive and go do that because what the world needs is more people who have come alive. Mm. And so as the antidote to, I gotta do all this inner work and I gotta overcome all my issues and I gotta overcome all these things, carve a little of that effort and energy out to just find ways to be more lit up. And you may see that you don't have as much work to do on yourself as you think you do. Mm, that's a really great advice. Surprise, surprise. Maybe I'll, take <laughs> Maybe I'll actually yeah. listen to my advice. Yeah, the first intelligent thing you've said all day. <laughs> finally, I win. The caffeine has finally kicked in. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that that is, it's beautiful because, and it's something we talk a lot about on the, the podcast too around, it's really about finding work that fuels you. And what fuels me might not fuel you or somebody else. And that can be the trap again when we try to replicate other people or, or when we look at other people as having the quote unquote the figured out the road to success. And so we mimic them is we do end up just asking, what does the world need? And then trying to do that where in reality, it's like the world will come alive through your passion, through your intentional action, through you being happier. And we see this all the time. If you're happy, 
people around you are naturally happier just through product of being in proximity to you. It doesn't actually matter what you do. It's, yep. it's about the energy that you put out. And when we're creating a business, it's really asking ourselves, well, yeah, how do I want to show up? How do I want people to feel? What makes me come alive? What fuels me? And how can I just make sure I'm doing those things? Uh, which, uh, cause what, what, what your, you called yourself an activator of joy, right? Yep. yep. So those two points fit perfectly as a great little uh, bow that we can tie up right here. Yes. <laughs> Where it came back to it all at the end when it, at the end of the day, Jason's advice to you is just do things that make you happy. Hells yes. This could have been a four second podcast. What did we do? <laughs> this literally could have been four seconds long. That's all you could have said and it would have been done. Yeah. But I get the feeling that you and I like talking too much to, to, to wrap it up in a one. We're not really good at one liners. We, one, we always have one more thing. One more thing. <laughs> I had a woman one time that was working for me that said uh, she was doing some video editing. She's like, can you start speaking more in like, in like sound bites? And I said, no. Yeah. That's- no, it's just not, I'm going to have a long drawn out story and it's going to be a 20 minute long video and that's just how it's going to be. Uh, yeah. I, don't, I don't try to, if, if I try to interrupt my stream of consciousness to put it into soundbite form, I'm screwed and I'm not, I'm not really sharing what I want to share. So I'm glad that we had the forum to not have me speak in soundbites. Yes, yes. No, because then you kind of get stuck in this space of you're worrying about how to most appropriately market something versus focusing on the actual message and flow of how it how it comes out. And we again, we can get really lost around what we think we should be doing versus what actually feels great. Totally. Yeah, the feeling thing is so important. And the one last thing I'll say, uh, even though I know we, we already put a bow on it, but it's That's okay. <laughs> something that I think is really helpful, especially if you're like a coach or, or, or even, even if you're not a coach, but especially for coaches, consultants, uh, course creators, online educators, whatever, is that in the very beginning when I started coaching, I had a couple other, uh, I was in tech for about 15 years. We didn't really talk about my background stuff, which is totally fine. I don't care. Uh, I was in tech for about 15 years. I had two other startups, uh, one in partnership with NASA and the shuttle program and one in transportation before I became a coach. And so once I actually became a coach, it was the first time that it was like selling myself and not Mm -hmm. like selling another product or service outside of me. And I was obsessed with figuring out what I was going to be known for. Like, what's the thing I could hang my hat on? What's like the one idea or the one principle? And I would look at people that were big and I'm like, oh man, he has his thing and she has her thing. What's my thing going to be? And I obsessed over it and it, it held me back so much. And I know a lot of coaches feel this way. And then one day it finally occurred to me it was after the book came out actually. And I was doing kind of like a press tour thing. And the very last TV interview that I did was a uh, good day, Sacramento, which was, it was awesome. They were a great crew and the different shows you go on. Some people, you can tell they didn't even open the cover of the book, let alone read any of it. But this guy, his name is Cody Stark. Uh, really awesome dude that the anchor that interviewed me. And he had actually read at least half the book because he had really good questions. And what he said at the end of the interview to me was he said, Jason, that was so great. Like, thanks for the interview. He's like, but I just got to tell you, you bring so much joy into the room when you come in. He's like the AV people that like hooked you up with the mic said it, the people in the green room said it, the other anchor said it, you just bring so much joy. And I, I had heard that before, but I'd always kind of brushed it off because I'm like, yeah, but that's not smart. That's not monetizable. That doesn't make mm-hmm. me feel important. You know, joy, what the hell does that mean? And then I realized in that, that day, it was, okay, cool. I don't need to focus on what I'm going to be known for. I'm going to focus on what I'm going to be known for activating in other people. Mm -hmm. What can I be known for giving people permission to feel more of in their own life? And when I figured out that was joy for me and I leaned into that a thousand percent, everything started to fall into line. Everything started making sense. And so I think it's really important to figure out what is it that you want to be known for activating in people and then go all in on that. That is like perfect advice. Uh, I, I, I do know like a lot, a lot, well, and I'm thinking about it because it's timely right now. I'm, I'm in the process, at least in the time of the record, this recording, I'm in the process of like behind the scenes rebranding. And, uh, I've been trying to employ more of that style of, of being is really, how can I actually just communicate to people what it's like to be around me? Mm-hmm. versus the super tangible, like I help X with X because whenever I try and fit, I help X with X, it makes it seem so like logical based when time and time again, any single person that's ever worked with me, either in a group, at a retreat, one-on-one, who's seen me speak or been to a workshop that I've done, listened to the podcast, whatever, everyone always talks about how I make them feel. It's never about like, they're like, you give really great strategy and you give the practical strategy piece, but it's the first thing that they always comment on is how I make them feel. And so it finally dawned on me 
well, that's just like, I need to, I need to represent who I actually am and what I'm actually doing, even if it feels counterintuitive to what we're told to do via marketing. Um, So I appreciate that even just for myself. It's a good You're reminder. You're very welcome. I'm, I'm excited for you. I, I can't Thank wait you. to see what it, what it looks like for sure. Thank you. It's going to be, it's going to be fun because that's, if it's not fun, I'm not interested. That's <laughs> so, who you are. So exactly. Exactly. Uh, well, thank you so much again, Jason. I really appreciated you coming on. Uh, and yeah, thank you. And then thank you to also to everyone listening. As always, if you liked today's episode or you like any of the episodes, please always feel free to rate, review, subscribe, share this with other people who you think will find a lot of value in it. I will be sure to put in all of Jason's social media and all the ways in which you can get him. Um, Prison Break. What's like the little undertone of the of Prison Break? Like, what's the, the subtitle? Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's uh, sorry, wrong shoulder. Uh, it's vanquish the victim, own your obstacles, and lead your life. And I'm going to give you a, a, a link so that all of your listeners can get a free copy of it, uh, free oh, awesome. digital or, or audio copy. And if they're in the States, sorry if you're out of the States, but if you're in the States, I'll send you a free paperback copy. You just pay a couple bucks for shipping and handling. So oh, cool. I'll give you a link to that so you can share with your listeners too. Okay, awesome. So there, I was going to make them search it themselves, but <laughs> there we go. Okay, that's great. Because I think... I know for me, based on the stuff that we talked about today, like I'm really excited. I've only ever read excerpts of it and seen you speak. So I'm really looking forward to reading the book myself as well. Uh, And also to everyone listening, the reminder that you are doing way better than you're giving yourself credit for. Keep showing up, keep kicking ass. I believe in you. I know Jason enough now to know that he believes in you too. Totally. Keep showing up. Exactly. Yeah. Keep showing up. Keep kicking ass. You've got this. And we will talk with you next week.